Right. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's great to see you in such a packed room. Uh, I hope uh, I can live up to your presence. Uh, some of you know me, you know me for, I'm usually hosting these events, not being the actual speaker. So I have a newfound pre uh, appreciation for the pressure involved in, in delivering what will hopefully be a useful, interesting, insightful, maybe even a momentarily funny and inspiring talk. Getting invited to uh, be this year's visiting uh, professor, uh, I checked out, of course, the previous professors, and there's um, something called imposter syndrome that people may have heard of before. Uh, I, be honest, with you, I have never felt it before until at getting being asked into this role and thinking, "Wow, I've got some impressive, uh, I've got some impressive predecessors uh, bef uh, before me." Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, my talk tonight, and of course, I'll be working double hard. In, in America, there's a, there's a rental car company called Avis, and their famous slogan is, we try harder, because they were number two to, to Hertz. So I will certainly be trying very hard indeed to, to live up to this, to this great honor. Uh, and of course, I have to thank uh, Sharon and uh, Sharmista and uh, the staff of the business school for being uh, incredibly supportive in terms of getting me onboarded, if you will. Uh, of course, the Goldman family uh, who make this possible. Uh, it's been great to, to meet you tonight as well, and, and look forward to speaking some more later. Uh, and uh, it's a well, it's a great contribution uh, back to Newcastle and Newcastle University to uh, to have their endowment, and it's a great honor now to become part of it. So there are other people to thank, but I will I will do a bit more of that later. So I'll, on with my talk, although this still sounds odd to me. Is are you guys okay with the? the okay, great. I'll just continue. Just presume that's okay. All right, cool. So, Innovation, Entrepreneurship, Leadership, and TED Talks. So I will begin with just a bit of background first uh, on, on me. Assuming this is working. <laughs> Another take of a while. Hey, fantastic. So, uh, as, as mentioned before, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I, uh, well, there I am. Uh, I was raised in, you can guess that's me in the bottom, <laughs> bottom left here. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, and as you can tell, I was, I was, I think, the only minority in my entire school at the time, but they were very lovely people, and I had a great experience there. Uh, I was uh, educated, I got a history degree at Princeton University, graduated in 1989. I went on to the Wharton School at uh, Philadelphia and got my MBA in 1996. As part of my MBA, uh, I did a semester at London Business School, uh, which is sort of what got me into, if you will, my, my, uh, my, my journey here to the UK. And uh, what happened was via London Business School, uh, I, was, I went, then went to go work for IBM, and uh, my best, well, a friend of mine uh, via LBS uh, told me that Blackwells in Oxford were looking to set up an internet bookshop. So, 96, 97 was just as Amazon.com started to become a thing where in, in, in the book world. And they wanted to try and do the same thing. So here I am, arriving a lot skinnier <laughs> in 97 at, uh, this is obviously in front of the, the, one of the original Black Wolf shops uh, in, in, in Oxford. Uh, from there, uh, I, I eventually ended up uh, at, my last job down south was with O2. And I was going to take, I was there for a couple of years, and I was about to take a job at Orange, <coughs> or at least considering it. And my best friend from O2 was from Newcastle, and convinced me to take a look at this unusual opportunity. An organization called One Northeast, a regional development agency, as was, were wanting to set up um, a, a series of uh, centers of excellence. They were going to be not for profit, uh, not for profit companies that were set up to sort of promote the growth of certain technology areas. And mine would be in digital technology and media as was. Uh, I, so it came in 2002, October 2002, was when I arrived here uh, on Geordie Shores. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was really, actually, I'll just pause really one quick, because when I was offered the role, uh, this is, I, was, I was down in London, and I was just I was saying this before, that uh, it was interesting the reaction that people had about the possibility about moving to Newcastle. And so, some, actually, I will be honest with you, the, the, the Northeast <laughs> folks that were in London were kind of like, you don't worry, they want to go. I don't think this is the right advice for you. 
Whereas all my London-based friends are like, it sounds so exciting. I hear all this great stuff about Newcastle. You should definitely go do it. So I mean, ultimately, I followed my gut. And obviously, I came in October 2002. And we eventually set up something uh, called CodeWorks. And uh, actually, Chris Pywell, who was one of the two guys, uh, and Mike Coper, I think they're both here. They were the, the two guys most uh, uh, directly responsible for, for convincing me to, to make my journey up north. And uh, we set it up in, in, in 2002. As mentioned, it was a not-for-profit economic development company with funds both from the UK government as well as from the EU. And uh, the early years uh, were, in my opinion, really good. I mean, we were doing all these great projects. We were getting research funding bids, uh, successful bids done. We were helping spin out companies. We grew a, we inherited a, a, a networking association called Digital Media Network from Southern University. And we were able to grow, put some more money into it and grow it and, 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 and make it really thrive. But then, <clears throat> this is about, I guess it was around 2004, so it's been about two years into it. The political environment totally changed around us. And One Northeast, uh, <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, for, the, for, the, for economic historians in the room, you will, you will remember that everyone from the chair all the way through many of the, the board directors, the executive directors, the CEO, they were all replaced in very short order. And as some of you will know that when new management comes in, they tend to like to do things differently from the last group. And so uh, we had a board meeting in February 2005 and one of these new directors came to our board meeting and announced, unbeknownst to us, that we were going to be shut down uh, effective immediately. And, uh, which was quite a shocking board meeting, as you could, as you could imagine. Uh, we, uh, we didn't see it coming. We, we should have seen it coming, to be fair, uh, in, in retrospect. But we didn't see it coming. And it was a big shock. So uh, what ended up happening was, I, I was I obviously I only have, uh, I, well, technically I think I have 40 minutes. But with all my TED training, I've learned to not treat that as a target, but as a ceiling. So I will, I will try to keep my remarks well beneath the, the, that 40 minute mark and not test your patience. Uh, we, we luckily had a lot of relatively senior folks on our board, and they helped us to kind of fight back, if you will. And uh, we, uh, in the end, we weren't shut down the effect of the media. There's a whole wonderful long story about what happened in back channeling, and actually probably quite a useful a lesson for, for how you deal with some of the political battles that you will, some of you will inevitably have to fight as you deal in organizational life. But we did, uh, but we suffered through it. We uh, got literally our funding cut in half, uh, effective immediately. Uh, we, uh, and, and, and that funding would continue to dwindle year after year thereafter. Uh, we were also given uh, huge uh, new financial targets to show that we could become self-sustainable. And we had to show that we could grow our what we call private income by a factor of four in something like three years. So, and I think those targets were set there because they assumed that we would fail and that you know that we, we just then could, could go away quietly versus in the kind of dramatic show trial way that we nearly went. Um, so uh, we obviously needed to do something different. What we thought was good was clearly not good enough. Uh, I, I happened to, and very appropriately, happened that have been recommended for years to read this book by Jim Collins, a former Stanford University Business School professor called Good to Great. I imagine most people have at least heard of it, if not read, they're not read it. And, and after about 10 years of not actually reading any books, uh, it, I picked this time of crisis to pick this thing up and actually give it a proper read. I won't summarize the entire book, but the things that I drew from it were in terms, in terms of this idea of going from good to great, was that there were really three things, which was understanding what you were passionate about, uh, which for us was easy. We were truly passionate about innovation and creativity uh, and digital technology, what was happening in digital media. That part was easy. Uh, what, we, uh, what, we also be, what we also became very good at at CodeWorks, uh, to, somewhat to our surprise, but it wasn't necessarily a big focus of us, was we seemed to be unusually good at running events and conferences. So we started, as I mentioned, with these networking events which then grew to half-day conferences. We then did a full-day conference that Microsoft sponsored. Uh, they actually wrote us a letter to say it was one of the best organized events we were in. I'm not saying that to pride, but it was, only, it was unusual because they literally wrote a physical letter to me at the time, which, was, which seemed so unusual. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, so the second thing that, that Collins talks about is 
finding the things that you are really, truly, unusually good at, you know, that you could argue you are world class. And that can't be 10 things, it can't be five things. It's maybe one, two, possibly three things, but you've got to be pretty disciplined. And so we ha had some inkling as to kind of, well, that's it. The third thing then is to figure out an economic model that wraps up this passion and this, and this competence into something that can build a flywheel. And then what was that? So at the same time, I picked up an issue of The Guardian, and it was very unusual for me at the time, because at the time I almost never read The Guardian, not, not because of the political leaning of it, but just because I thought it was a, a rather dull paper. But my, my staff was very much a left-leaning sort of staff, and we had, we had The Guardian. This is back when people used to get newspaper subscriptions. And <clears throat> so, uh, and it, it talked about something called the TED Conference, which back in 2005 uh, was obviously much less famous because there were no TED Talks. You had to uh, just, if you, uh, there was only the conference in California. And what, what TED had done was they had run a, uh, a test conference, uh, the first international TED conference they had ever run, which was uh, in Oxford. And the woman sort of waxed lyrical about her amazing, it was actually a woman, uh, the writer was for the, for the Guardian, uh, it was Carol Cadwallader, who was the same person that reported on the Cambridge Analytica scandal, as well as another scandal as well, so she's, she's gone on to, to do some amazing work. And so I, as you did, you go, I Googled it, and I discovered that the main conference was in California at the time, Monterey, and it cost the bargain price of $4,500 to get one ticket. Uh, you get nothing else. You didn't get food. You didn't get hotel. You didn't get flights. It was just literally entrance into this conference. Now, obviously, I couldn't afford to. And, and then, in addition to that, to add insult to injury, you had to apply to get into this thing. I'm like, wow, you want to fleece me and beg at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but they, I did find out through some sleuthing that Adobe sponsored a program for not-for-profits and charities to be able to attend, not for free, but it was like an 80% discount. So it made it, I think it brought it down to about $1,000, which is, I guess, in the realm of normal, or still quite pricey. So I did my best job in terms of, you know, begging and pleading that they let me in and, and made the case, and luckily they did. So I got to go in 2006, and what's the next slide here? Oh, no, this is wrong, okay. And so, and I, and I had a, I had a, uh, I had, I had really a life-changing experience. It's changed my life to this very day. My life is on a totally different arc. Some positive, some less positive, but it, it's certainly different. Uh, and um, it was, well, I'm sure, well, sitting in this room, I'm sure everyone in this room has attended a conference of some form or a trade show or an exhibition. And for me, up to this point, I had done a lot of work for IBM in the space. I was on this traveling thing where we were marketing various IBM services and things. Uh, and I hated it. I, I, I hate, I, there was the, these, so for the conference bit, it was, I mean, it was an experience where, by the end of the day or the end of the two days, you were just desperate to get out of there and just bored and exhausted. And you know, so TED was three and a half or four days. It started at 8.30 in the morning and it ended at something like six, right? So this is a, these are long days and packed in, of course, it has become famous for all these short talks. So something like whatever it is, 45, 50 speakers in this time, plus all this other breakout stuff and things like that. So I thought, oh my God, this is gonna kill me by the time I get it. But, I sat for this three and a half day thing, and from, from 8.30 in the morning to the end, I was glued to my seat. It was like it was watching a thriller, and uh, for, for three and a half days. And I would, I would come back, about, and my, my partner, and uh, my, our daughter had traveled with me, and I would come back just bursting with energy about like this amazing experience I was having. And um, it, what I think it did was it helped me to reconnect with uh, that joy of learning. So it, I, I love my university experience. I love my business school experience. Uh, and part of it was the intellectual stimulation. Part of the stimulation as well from colleagues that you meet there and things like that. And then once you leave the, the halls of universities, I think, for me at least, learning became a lot more transactional. You know, it was something that I did because I had to do or I needed to you know, learn a new skill to do something or whatever it might be. And Ted, for me, just reconnected me with that joy of, 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 of just learning something new that might not be completely related, related to you, what you do professionally at all. And I think that's what really it kind of sort of turned me on about. So I had my idea as well. The other thing I also realized, sorry, is that uh, Ted makes just an insane amount of money, right? So the, it's, it's just uh, like I, I've, I got to know some of the support team 
and they kind of you know, <coughs> away this like I think about 1,200 attendees. Everyone paid. Everybody pays, right? You know, other than the speakers, they're the only ones that, that don't pay. And then of course they match the amount of. You do some quick math here. 1,200 people paying $4,500. It adds up pretty quickly. And of course, to get sponsored as well. So I thought, oh my God, so it's like this is what we should do. So it's like, I've got the passion, I've got <clears> that we've got this confidence in conferences, and now we have this model. So I, this is where. So I, I came back, and I we did actually write to Ted, or email Ted, to try and we called him Project Jordy Ted, and uh, they never emailed me back. Uh, I say. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so, so we obviously couldn't call it TED, and we just came up with, we brainstormed for a while, and came up with Thinking Digital, which is uh, uh, the, the conference as it's known today. And uh, we launched it in 2007. The first conference was in 2008. And it was basically, this is our Bethany company. This was going to be how we solve all of our problems. We would, it would become a profitable, sustainable event. But it would also service our, our public duty aims in terms of hopefully being a great event for knowledge transfer, but also hopefully being something that could be iconic to the to the wider world outside the Northeast to show the kind that there is a community here that would support an event like Thinking Digital. And like Ted, we scoured the world to find uh, a group of uh, amazing speakers uh, in, in a huge variety of different fields. I won't go through all of them all, but you'll have you know for this. The person up here was the, the person that invented what's become the Microsoft Surface. Uh, you've got uh, 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 um, Jared Thorpe, oh, actually Rachel Armstrong, who's here at the university as well. And so uh, it's just a very eclectic group of really, really interesting people. Uh, this, at this point, the Sage was now a little bit over 10 years old. When we started, obviously, the Sage was, was less than five years old. And it was, you know, it's this beautiful structure. And we were going to put our conference in, into, this, into this iconic venue. And, um, so we launched it, and what we discovered was that um, putting on a conference like a TED-like conference, especially in 2007 8 when no one knew what TED was, uh, and asking people to pay for the privilege of coming to this event, because in the north at the time, because there was a lot more public money floating around, many, if not most businesses, friends were actually free of charge. They just wanted you to attend. Uh, we had the audacity to ask people to pay upwards of, of 500 so we didn't. We clearly didn't know what we were doing. I mean, launching anything new for the first time is more difficult than you think it's going to be. And so uh, what we discovered was that all this great talk about uh, good to great and the TED conference soon really became devolved into uh, a, 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 a mission of survival and really just not being humiliated in public. <laughs> and, and uh, just to give you a sense of it, so we had put the conference in uh, Hall 2, or what's now called Sage 2, of the Sage Gates Head. We told about 350 people. And with about six weeks to go, we might have had about 100 people. So, and you know, we were flying people from all over the world into this thing and things like that. And so we did a lot of begging, borrowing, pleading, and just finding ways to get, frankly, just some bums on seats, if you will. And so, we get there, in the end. Um, it doesn't sell out, obviously, by some distance. Uh, it's, it's financially not very positive uh, either. Uh, but we roll the dice for 2009, uh, partially because we have no other plan, so. <laughs> we just pretty much thinking it can't get any worse than last year, right? <laughs> But it does. Uh, <laughs> so you probably recognize this as the former headquarters of Lehman Brothers. So we launched the conference uh, at the beginning of September. And I think it was something like two weeks later that, that the, the financial crisis sort of begins in, 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 in real. And, and it has a very real effect on us, even though this is all to some extent happening far away because our, <coughs> our top two sponsors from last year, the 2008, were Microsoft and Cisco, and they both pretty much immediately say, we're not going to get involved in here at all. We're not going to send anybody. We can't provide any speakers. We really, it's up to you. We're, we're basically locking the whole thing down while we figure out what on earth is happening in, in, in the world today. And so, yeah, we thought, wow, we have found a new, a, new, a, a, a lower circle of hell that we've descended down into. <laughs> but we, um, we kind of round up the wagon and basically we just, because obviously the, the, there's not much to do in the, in the autumn, we thought we would wait until 
the, uh, the spring uh, before, sort of February, March, before the May conference to really kind of go hard in terms of marketing the conference and promoting it and getting people to attend. <clears throat> and then a weird thing started to happen around, I think it was around November of the year before, this is now November 2008, leading into 2009. <clears throat> we didn't know why, but people started to buy absence in significant numbers. And, and, and the weird thing is, is that we were doing no active marketing. We weren't emailing, we weren't doing ads or whatever, and yet somehow or another people were finding out about the event and buying passes for it, right? So, which was cool, obviously, and uh, so our attendance is way up from the year before, our revenue is way up, uh, yet so on and so forth, and we, we almost break even this year after obviously losing a lot of money the year before. So, naturally, I won't leave it there, what, you know, what did actually happen? So, uh, as I mentioned, there were a lot, all these negatives about 2008 uh, in terms of running that first conference, but one thing we did get was the feedback for the people who did attend was spectacular. I mean, they loved the event. I guess to some extent there was nothing like it at the time, uh, even anywhere else, probably in, in Europe. And also 2009 passed your mind back to a time before social media. It had just started to become a thing, right? And so we had people who had blocked, it turned out uh, one of the most popular UK tech blockers was in the audience and wrote a, a spectacularly nice and, and complimentary blog about it. Uh, we had convinced Sky News to come. They, they, when they heard that uh, one of our speakers, Ray Kurzweil, who's now head of engineering at Google, was going to be one of our speakers, they came and, and they wanted to cover the conference, but more specifically, Ray. And as they do, they created a kind of five, ten minute segment on it. And in the old days, if you happened to have seen it when it was on air, then you would have thought, oh, that's cool. But of course, this was just the first time that people were starting to then archive videos on the internet. So you now have something shareable, right? So in a sense, Sky News has created a 10 minute ad on our behalf that we can now show around to people and, and things. And, and, and the final thing was, was Twitter because of course, again, imagine Twitter in the early days when people were still actually talking about their lunch. They had nothing else to talk about at the time, right? <laughs> of course, today it's very, very, very different. So we, I guess, had something that people you know, were willing to share and were excited to share and were kind of helping it go quietly viral. And so, uh, to just give some, some numbers here, so 2008, not surprising, our top referring to the website was from Google. 2009 is still the same thing, but we see with Twitter that uh, it was at 3% of the traffic, and then it goes up by a factor of seven in a single year. Uh, so, it just, and we had no idea what was happening at the time, but we just since, since afterwards discovered that that was what was, was helping drive the, the interest so in 2011, uh, we were able to expand the conference into a second hall, and, we, and, and luckily we continue to sell out. We're now trending annually during the conference at, at number one Twitter in the UK, which was nice. We're starting to get some recognition, so this is the next web, which just got bought by the Financial Times, that announcement came out today. Uh, they, they covered us and said some, some nice things. They were duly impressed, I guess. This is the, the Metro newspaper uh, writing us up. Uh, the Guardian, going back to the source of it all, uh, gave, gave, us, gave me the, the ultimate compliment, I refer to as the, uh, the UK's dead. And as Savas mentioned, we started to get some other really nice uh, national recognition in Wire and, and Guardian. And I'd like to say we live all happily, happily ever after after that. <laughs> and that was the end of the journey of the story, but sadly, uh, yeah. this yeah. That happened in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think many of you know, certainly Chris will know, they decided one of their first acts was to figure out a way to shut down the RDAs, our main funders, um, immediately or very, very, very soon. And so uh, by April 2011, all funding ceased for CodeWorks. But we did decide to try and keep going. So we ran it for about another 15 months or so. Uh, but a year into it, we kind of realized when you go from you know, funding of about a million a year to zero, it's a, it's a lot harder to operate the company. <laughs> and uh, of course, everyone else in, in the similar space was having exactly the same sort of funding cuts. So there was, there was a lot less money floating around just generally. And we're all just adjusting to this new normal. So I faced a choice, uh, which was we were going to, you know, we were going to shut down the company. And so what should we do with 
Thinky Digital. And we, we were able to sell off, we had two other conferences, called one called Design to Build It, the other one called Game Horizon, we were able to sell those on. Uh, Gated Council uh, uh, took on our networking uh, group called Coworks Connect. Today it's now rebranded as Digital Union. But then this left this thing, could I just sell off the, uh, so much of my personal and professional reputation seemed to be wrapped into Thinky Digital, could I really just sell it off to the highest bidder? And so I decided that I would, and I also, you know, I really felt like I had a responsibility to take, you know, unfortunately the reality is that, you know, when, when there is large amounts of government money around, various initiatives do get started, things like that, up to the point when there isn't less government money initiatives around to fund these initiatives. And then oftentimes the people go, very understandable, I'm not, that's, not a, that's not a critical thing, that's just reality. Uh, but I felt like I really owed it to the conference and the community that supported the conference and the Northeast to try and keep it going. So I sold my house, this is my old house in Liverpool, uh, and uh, used the proceeds to buy Thinky Digital uh, from my former company. Unfortunately, as a director of, Thinky, of CodeWorks, I couldn't just give myself the, the company, or the, the conference, and, uh, and set, up, uh, set, up, set up Thinky Digital Limited, uh, which is uh, my, my current venture. And uh, this was 2012 now, and um, pretty simply, the, the mission was pretty simple. One was, could we, could we, could we survive as an independent venture? You know, it's hard when you come from a situation where you're part of an organization that receives significant uh, funding to uh, underpin the, the venture. And then, and then really, we also didn't want it to become a kind of survival exercise merely where we're cutting corners left, right, and center, and the, the, kind of the quality of the conference suffers. So we really wanted to continue to try and make it the best possible experience we could. Uh, and then since then, I mean, luckily, uh, obviously we're still here, which is great. And you know, we're still getting good feedback about the event, which is great. Uh, and we have, uh, in fact, Yara Grzynski is our, our headline sponsor, Transmission Dynamics. It's lovely to see him here, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we have done a, a bunch of other Thinking Digital's in Manchester, London, and Thinking Digital Women, also with Newcastle University, but with, uh, the, uh, with the Computer Science Department. Uh, we have also, uh, again, given, uh, given our, our, our heritage with TED, we've now taken on a bunch of different TEDx events in Newcastle, Manchester, and Liverpool. And fortunately, all of these have done well as well. So in Newcastle, we, we took a bit of a hiatus. Uh, it's now in, in Hall 1, in Sage 1, uh, over at the Sage Gate TED, and that was over 1,000 people in October. Uh, we just did TEDx Manchester in February, and that was over 2,000 people. And then Liverpool, we did last summer, and that was 850 people. So we're, you know, we're starting to see some really significant audiences uh, to 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 keep these things going. Uh, we're also in charge of something called the Liverpool Binary Festival, which is more or less roughly a thinking digital for for Liverpool. Uh, I helped set up an organization called Tech North, uh, and was the founding chairman. And after an interesting first year, it uh, luckily went on to be uh, quite successful, and it was kind of the part of the. The, the business case it then creates something now called Tech Nation, which is a much larger organization that truly encompasses the, 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 the rest of the nation. And doing great work very similar to CodeWorks, which is really to champion the digital sector, but throughout the UK. And as mentioned, uh, I've joined uh, the, uh, the, 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 the board for the Sage Gates, and it's been a really, I mean, one thing that people sort of know, I mean, they've been on a remarkable journey as well. I think Abigail is here in the audience. Uh, she's the MD. Uh, and she inherited a situation where there was, uh, there was financial issues, let's just say, and she's done a remarkable job of, of really re-engineering uh, the or operation of that organization has, has taken it to, uh, to a much, much safer place uh, that's being recognized now by Yards Council England and others and things like that. So, Abigail, if you're in the audience, so it's, it's excellent. I know you didn't want me to talk about it, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, some observations. I mean, there's, there's a lot. To, to them, uh, but I promised something about TED, so I, I thought I should s say a little bit of, about it. So first of all, you know, what I was saying before to the Goldmans about, you know, it's, it's kind of that today, you know, there are millions of people around the world who might spend their Friday or Saturday night at home watching TED Talks, you know, and, and to think, to cast your mind back 10 years ago, to think that people would be doing this, you know, effectively watching 15-minute lectures as their leisure activity, is, is, you know, I would have said it would be unexpected. I, I, don't, I wouldn't have been able to forecast that, right? And of course, part of it is 
the ideas, and of course it's great to be exposed to various new ideas, but whether it be about science or technology or the arts or religion or whatever it might be. I also think that, um, what, I mean, certainly something that I've learned with my experiences, Ted, is, is what I call the, uh, the importance of narrative. And I, I feel like we actually, I, th I feel like we're actually in a global leadership crisis. And, and one of the things I would argue that the leader, what is the leader versus the manager, is the leader is in charge of the, the narrative of the organization, right? What is the story of the organization? And, and I, I look at, I mean, I've had a little bit of experience uh, working uh, with central government. And it's interesting, like if you're the prime minister, right? You know, so, you know, you have supposedly a lot of power, right? And you do, you do, you know, you're in charge of a lot, lots of things. But, you know, if you were just to try and change the NHS budget, even increase it by, just say, something like 0.1% increase above the whatever the plan is, right? The amount of work and, you know, hassle that's going to go into making that case and doing all the, you know, it's not going to be easy to do, even though it's a positive sort of thing, right? But one thing that, that you do control is your story, right? So your, 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 your narrative about, how, what you're going to talk about, who you're going to talk about, and how you're going to talk about them. And there's a much less process around, around doing that. And in many ways, I would argue the, the real power of the, of, of, of the PM uh, is their media power. And, and I think that, so I will give an example here about this. Um, all right, okay. So uh, I've been a long-time Hillary Clinton supporter. I donated the federal maximum to her uh, 08 campaign and well, it's the 16 campaign. And so but the odd thing was that my brother and mother were both supporters of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we, uh, we've obviously occupied different political camps for a while, so we were very <laughs> polite and stayed around this topic. But we did have, of course, a conversation at one point, and, and they were being very polite, and they just said, listen, just tell us why we should support Hillary. Why should someone vote for Hillary? And we completely accept that she's super experienced and super smart and all those things. We give you that. And, and I, I was stumped because they had basically taken away the thing that I was going to tell them about. <laughs> so, and what I realized was that she doesn't have a story. For what? Her story is basically don't vote for this other bozo. Right? <laughs> Which is actually, for people on her side, totally, you know, we hold this truth to be self-evident. That was a self-evident thing. But obviously for a lot of people, that was not true. And I did realize is that what he was telling them was he was telling them a story. You might call it horrible, built on lies, racist, whatever, all those words, right? But make America great again, put America first, and we're gonna build a wall. We're gonna do things that are different from before. And of course, in this country, in the same year, we, we have this, now, regardless of you know, what you're feeling and things like that, I mean, they did tell a story, right? It may have been built on lies, but it was something to give people to be. And I believe that people are actually desperate for narrative. They're so desperate, they'll knowingly believe a story they know is probably a lie. <laughs> and that's how bad it's become. And think about this, is that, can, can anyone remember the narrative for the Remain campaign? Right, and this is how bad it is. When I, if you ask me what was the narrative, of, of what was the kind of brand positioning of the Remain campaign, I think of Project Fear. So the other side not only brand, built their brand, they built the other side's brand for them. So what I began to realize about TED, and you know, learning to deliver, or absorbing TED talk, learning to deliver, is that it's really, in some ways, it's a form of leadership training. And I, I think that this, the narratives, the stories that are told by TED are, are being absorbed and grabbed onto, because people are desperate for narrative of some form. And, and I personally believe that, I mean, my experience, so I'm a you know, Prince de Grad and an award grad, right? And two of the certainly more, more best known, most, most prestigious organizations out there. And I really was not built to be a leader, I would argue. Um, I was, in my opinion, built to be a great manager, built to be a person that would fit into a large organization and learn how to get along well and play nice with others, uh, add up some numbers occasionally, write some words, and just kind of float up through the organization, if you will, right? And, 
And I think that's the and I think the problem right now is that what we're seeing is that, if you will, the bad guys are filling in the leadership gap. Yeah. They know this. They have this tool called how to be a leader, which I think the good guys, unfortunately, think too much is they kind of rest on this logic of we hold these truths to be self-evident, which is a line from the Declaration of Independence, and we've got to realize that you know we, we can't just simply rest our own uh, intellectual superiority. That's not going to that's not going to win the day anymore, unfortunately. And so, when I read about uh, the theme on leading on leadership, and that to me was a theme. I think because I think if you think about you know we're 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 in a world obviously where even communist countries are great in capitalism, right? I and mean, capitalism has clearly won, right? And it is in fact more or less sucking in with the, the you know the best and the brightest uh, of the uh, of the world. And so. A business school, to me, is, of course, it's got to do all the traditional academic things that it does, but it's such a wonderful opportunity to take people that are going to be leaders of organizations, companies, communities, possibly even countries, uh, and give them that, give them that you know, intangible thing around becoming a better leader. What, is, what does that involve? Right, we're getting to the end, I promise you. So, what have I learned as an entrepreneur? Okay, so when I started the company in 2012, what I realized was that, oh my God, I've been a salaried employee from birth. And what I mean by that is that, you know, when you're born, you basically step into a role, right? You're the child and you have certain sort of child responsibilities and you go to school and obviously you gotta get good grades, then the same again at university. And then you, you know, if you've gone to a decent school and a decent university, you come out into a decent job. And in that whole time, and it was, what I like to, is a, a way of, of contrasting that is that, you know, if the, if the CEO of Google were to disappear tomorrow, it would be unusual, I know, but <laughs> like Google would just continue to march on, right? It's, it's, and, and so I, I've always been part of a situation where there is a game being played, there are rules to that game, and whether or not I played almost didn't matter to the game, right? Whereas when you become an entrepreneur, you know, suddenly the, the rules of that game are run down to you. You've got to actually set up the rules. You've got to encourage people to come play your game. You've got to, you know, sort of motivate them and keep them excited and, you know, kind of get the ball rolling, which I think, you know, ultimately a startup company is that, is that you take something that doesn't exist and after a lot of hard work, hopefully you get it to a point where it has some sustainability and becomes an established enterprise. Uh, a big difference for me that in terms of what I, is, is in that, is that, you know, when you're in a, in a, in a organizational setting, right? A lot of your drivers and incentives are what I would call extrinsic, right? They're from outside you. There are incentives to hit. There are management goals that you've got to get, and, you know, whatever it might be, or funding to raise, or you know, whatever it might be. Uh, when you're an entrepreneur, it, all that drive has got to come from you, right? You know, you've got to provide that energy. You've got to provide the story, the reason, the logic, so on and so forth. And so, uh, for me personally, it has been an extraordinary, it's been another business school, effectively, since 2012, in terms of, because of course now, you know, you, you're not taking someone else's money and spending it to achieve something. This is, actually, in my case, it was literally, I'm playing with house money here, right? So, you can't just simply, you know, you've got to figure out other ways to get people to, to motivate them and to want to work with you. And it's tapped into all kinds of other, I guess, uh, sources of, of, of skill and, and uh, uh, management. So, this is about my last session. So, it, a few years ago, I had to give a talk at, at Durham University and they asked me to talk about my career. My first reply is, well, it's not over yet, by the way. I still, <laughs> <laughs> still feel like I'm learning. But I, I did this, I had this epiphany, it was just that like, so I feel like if you were to, if let's say you were to treat a person as an investment, and you know, how would you want you program an investment? So you, well, you want them to take, them to be low risk, you want them to, of course, hopefully maximize income, uh, and hopefully do prestigious things that aren't going to bring you know, the, the organization or the family into shame. And I feel like I was living that sort of very, low risk, high prestige, high income sort of life. It's, it's, very, it's a rational formula, but it's not one that is particularly that uh, fulfilling or inspiring. And what I realized was that if we go through, whoops, disaster one, disaster two, 
disaster three. Uh, I'm not calling them a disaster, but they had disastrous consequences for me. Uh, any, any, any real development of me as a person or as a pro profession were coming, it had come as a response to a major crisis, right? And, uh, and it's, it was ironic because I thought I had built my life to avoid crisis, right? To, to kind of stay always sort of, uh, 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 my, my friend Chris would call it the weasel way, which was kind of, you know, kind of staying under, underground, a bit, staying low to the ground, not being too noticed too hard, and, but still, you know, wanting to get all the, 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 the good and the glory of, of that. And so I concluded that talk with saying, if you don't seek out meaningful challenges, meaningful challenges will come and seek you out. You know, they're unavoidable, right? And so you might as well actually seek out them so that instead of responding to what felt like, you know, life-threatening professional crises, you're actually taking a proactive approach in terms of finding things that are important to you. And so I've even gone so far, this is where it gets woo-woo, this talk, <laughs> you know, around talking about things, advancing a little further and literally coming up with, I, th I think as meaning of life, I'd certainly be very happy to discuss alternative views on this, which is that it, the meaning of life is to pursue meaningful challenges with people you love and respect. And uh, I, I, I actually, I mean, I think it applies to anybody. Uh, you don't have to be a billionaire, you don't have to be a superstar a sports person, you can, you know, no matter where, what walk of life, this is something that uh, is accessible to you. So with this challenge mindset, it, I have, it has, you know, it really was a transformative moment. Because I was really struggling at the time, trying to understand, God, why am, I, why am I doing this company? I should just go back and get a job. Blah, blah, blah. But by reframing all this stuff, I realized, oh, wow, so all this stress is actually good. It's actually the one thing that's actually made me a better person. So, so and obviously, one of the things as an entrepreneur is that your health and your energy become even more important because obviously the whole company is depending on you being healthy and energetic, right? To do the things that need to be done. Uh, and as I mentioned, growing up, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of my advantages was that I was unusual, I never got sick, or I rarely got sick. I rarely got sick. I had, you know, I could really bank on endurance. I was that person that could, you know, pull all nighters and still be fresh the next day and all that sort of jazz through college and into my early career. But then uh, I took on another challenge, meaningful challenge, was I had a daughter, and uh, so going into my 40s, I was getting sick all the time, and uh, you're catching stuff from her. We'd, get, we'd go twice a year to uh, visit my parents. Uh, I, I would always get sick on the way back, sometimes get sick on the way there and on the way back, uh, and then also suffered from massive jet lag. I mean, it was really, 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 it was worse, way, way worse than, 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 than the early days. And so, I, a, fr a, a, a friend of mine, actually was a tech entrepreneur in Manchester, uh, tweeted out this link, uh, which uh, two years ago, how to never get sick again, a YouTube link. And of course, I was, had just, I was sick, so <laughs> it was very attractive. I clicked on this thing, and I, I learned about this guy, Wim Hof, who's this, this crazy, wacky Dutch guy that has a Wim Hof method. I won't go through the whole thing in detail, but basically it involves meditation, which I'm sure folks in the room have at least heard about, if not attempted to try. Uh, some, some, some deep breathing exercises, um, but most notably, <laughs> exposure to the cold. Uh, and, and, and just to be clear, you don't start off with ice baths, that would be dangerous. You start off with taking a normal hot shower, and then you end with maybe some lukewarm water for 30 seconds uh, on your feet, and then you just kind of build up from there. And so, for me, about three months or so into this, uh, I was able to actually start taking Ice baths, and this is uh, my friend's bathroom in New Hampshire. Uh, this is the, a bath at a hotel in, in Orlando. And uh, shockingly enough, discovered I could do, and part, part of the reason Booth is this, I'd heard about Wim Hof for years. In fact, I went to a TED talk of his in Amsterdam in 2010. And as soon as he said cold showers, I literally stopped listening. I had no interest whatsoever, right? And uh, so the idea that I could actually do this was, was kind of amazing. So it's only been that for two plus years. I've had three warm showers in that time. The last warm shower was 17th of July, 2017. And I know that only because it was the day after my birthday and it was my treat, my birthday treat was a warm shower. And so I've had zero days ill in that time. Uh, I can no longer get jet lag. I have, of course, ridiculous little gas bills. <laughs> Six pounds 20 in October. I mean, that's how low it is, right? And of course, great satisfaction that I could do this. A certain kind of macho pleasure that I could actually do this. The words macho pleasure and Herb Kim don't often go together in the same sentence, so uh, at least in this one instance, I can. And 
I have a video that I'm going to play, but I'm not going to play it because I'm so far over time. Should I, should I not play it? It's a, actually, it's a one minute video. It's a one minute video. So one other thing that I feel like I have learned is uh, to not take myself too seriously uh, as well. Uh, and, and, and to have a little humility and use that to your advantage. And hopefully this, this one minute video will, will give you a, a quick example of that. Oh no. Oh, sorry. Okay. Anyways, this was in closing, but this will be at the very end. So things to take away, good to great, please read it if you haven't. Uh, learn how to communicate and tell a story. Uh, ice baths. Uh, <laughs> meaning of life. Uh, and short video. Uh, so I founded Thinking Digital um, back uh, in 2008 was our first conference uh, and in 2015 this is our eighth year running. My name is Steve Mould, I'm a science presenter and I'm speaking today about the birth of my daughter and the data that surrounds that. It's uh, a unique talk, I think it breaks the mould. Well, what I would say is that I think it's become obvious now that it's, everything is actually about the shirt chores. I think more than the speakers, more than this venue, uh, more than any single factor of thinking digital, it's what shirt I choose is what makes the difference between success or failure. You could say, here's the mould, oh look, it, it's broken, the, the mould has been broken, I am breaking it now. Yeah, you, can see, you see what I'm saying. It's a metaphor. It really makes such a, has such a huge influence on how I feel. You know, um, pick the wrong shirt and I feel weak all day and it comes across, you know, that weakness. And, and the speakers who seem all very friendly and things, they feed on that weakness. It's, it's just experience. After eight years, if there's one factor, if there is one factor, it is really shirt choice. So finally, thank you. Uh, of course, once again, uh, thank you to Sharon. Thank you to Allison, who's done such a, a wonderful job and then with continuing projects going forward into the future. Uh, to the entire Newcastle University Business School uh, staff who have been so uh, welcoming and supportive. Of course, a huge thanks to the Goldman family for making all this possible and for their many contributions throughout the Northeast. Um, and speaking of the Northeast, I don't know how can I thank the Northeast uh, in the sense that, you know, I'm this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, you know, I'm just this Korean American guy that's showed up here in 2002. And uh, I have been uh, just so warmly embraced and supported all the way throughout, as well as challenged. I mean, one, of the, one of the things I say, uh, we've said with Allison, is that one of the advantages for me about being in the North is that because it is a less wealthy, part of the world, and people's willingness to say, nah, you know, is, is a lot, and, and, you know, of course, though, that, that exposure to truth, which in, in wealthier places, people just kind of politely don't say anything and just ignore you, if you will, having some of that sort of stuff uh, put in my face kind of was, was part of the forces. And I like to say, without getting into the woo-woo land here, that you know, I think I feel like the North helped make me a, a man, certainly a better man than than I was, uh, and that I feel like I've been benefited being here more so than had I stayed in London or New York or these other places, which are all great, and they all have their advantages, as well, obviously. So, um, and thank you to the audience here for 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 taking the time to be with us, and uh, for uh, hopefully you've enjoyed some of the stuff I said, and I think now I've got to hand over back to Savas. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Okay.